a weekly exercise. Thank you. you. May be seated. Always have to choose a five-verse hymn to be able to make it all the way up there and all the way back. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn tonight to Acts chapter 27, verses 1 through 12. Acts chapter 27 and verses 1 through 12. Looking at Sailing Slow After Fast, part 2. Acts chapter 27, verses 1 through 12. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. And entering into a ship of Adramitium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul, and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when we were sailing slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Cnidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete, over against Salmone, and hardly passing it, came into a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh unto which was the city of Lycia. Now, when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain unto Phoenice and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that the word of God is infinite, that it's quick, living, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Your word judges not only what we say, but what we intend. Our motivations, our attitudes, our thoughts, Father, we pray that you will take your word and use it to penetrate our spirits tonight, pierce our souls, cause us to understand not only the technical things that are going on in the text, but what it is that you would have us to know so that we might obey, so that we might live for Christ, not merely know about him. And so, Father, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You recall last week we looked at part one and saw that, first of all, the passage gives an illustration of a man who started out in unbelief and then later believed the words of Paul in total contrast to Agrippa, whom we've just looked at in the last chapter. We're also given this man's name, just like we were given Agrippa's name. This is one called Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. We noted some things about his character last week. For example, we noticed that he was a kind man, verse 3. But we also noted that he was a pragmatist rather than a man of faith in verse 11. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken of by Paul. He does not understand yet the connection between the supernatural realm and the natural realm. And so he's going on the basis of a sea captain, which seems reasonable enough as to the captain thinking that he can carry his ship and it would be a great cost to him if he lost it. So why not trust the captain of the ship? rather than trusting some Jew who he's taking to Rome for judgment. But later, after he sees the supernatural hand of God and begins to realize that, he chooses to believe Paul in the most important crisis situation when it really matters, when believing the sailors would have cost him his life. 
The second thing that we saw was the principle of the sovereignty of God at work in eight different ways. I just listened for you quickly. There was a specific ship, a specific time, a specific location, a specific centurion, a specific captain and band of sailors, a specific destination, a specific group of passengers, and a specific divinely ordained storm. We see the ship in our text being slowed down so that it will be right at exactly the spot in the middle of the ocean when the storm Eurachlidon hits later on. Slow sailing after fast. Divinely ordained storms in our lives are totally under the control of God as to their timing, as to their duration, as to their intensity, as to their direction and control, nothing is of man, but it is all of God. Those are things outside the realm of man's control that come into our lives. The third thing that we saw was these same elements are always found in God's direction for our lives today. There are specific temporal items like the ship that God's going to use. God surrounds us with specific temporal resources that he used to test our lives. Second, we saw that there, just like with Paul, there is specific timing. You're not here by accident at this particular point in history. Third, we saw that just like with Paul here in this situation and the others who are traveling with him, Luke and Aristarchus at the least, there are specific places. You've been at thousands and perhaps hundreds of thousands of locations at different times in your life. As God weaves his plan for all of human history as well as for your life. And as I noted last week, you are not insignificant. Your life is an essential thread in the divine tapestry of eternity. Not just the big things that happen, and I gave the illustrations of my two trips to China, my, you know, my uh, trip to Israel where I met Judy when I went to study, and all those things that we think are life altering, but all the things that happen in your life, your trips to the grocery store, the people that you come in contact with. I had the privilege of talking to a couple of people this week and sharing the gospel with them uh, in very odd kinds of situations. You would never think of it as a witnessing opportunity, but God opened the door for that. I hope you pay attention to what God's doing so that you can be used in the ordinary, everyday circumstances of life. There are no accidents in the plan of God. There are no irrelevant events. There are no worthless experiences if we view them from the divine perspective and ask what God is trying to teach us. Fourth, we saw that there were specific people who were going to make an impact on our lives, just like the ship captain, just like the centurion, just like the band of soldiers. Specific people like Agrippa and Bernice and Festus and Felix and all these people that God has been lining up so that he can get Paul to Rome, which is the ultimate destination that God wants Paul to go to because he's promised him he's going to witness to emperors, to kings. There are specific people who make an impact on our lives, and we talked about all the list of the different kinds of people that have impacted us, our parents, our grandparents, our ancestors, the teachers, pastors, friends, relatives, the enemies, the employees, the employers, the people who encouraged us, the people who irritated us. God's using every one of them to conform us to the image of Christ. Number five, we saw that there were specific people, just like in our text, upon whom God will use us to make an impact. And we were reminded of the divine obligation that each one of us has to make an impact on every person with whom we come in contact. Because our life is ordered by God, and so is the life of every person on the planet, we have no accidental contacts. We are supposed to make some kind of an impact on the people with whom we come in contact. And we talked about asking ourselves the question, what kind of an impact did we make by what we said, did, the attitudes that we had, even to casual observers? We asked questions like, were you whining, fussing, shouting, pouting, swearing, praising God, smiling, frowning, resisting, obeying? We are a living epistle known and read of all men, as Paul says about the Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, For you are you, our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. People are watching you. I discovered that a long time ago when I was a little boy. 
that no matter where I went, somebody knew my father. They knew who I was. They were watching me. I'd had people come up to me and say to me, it's people I had never seen before, aren't you Dwayne Spencer's son? I thought, wow, they were just watching me. They caught a glimpse of me and they said, hmm, I wonder what his father has taught him in this particular kind of a situation. It made me always be on my toes because somebody was watching who knew who I was. Same with you. God always has a witness there who knows who you are, who watches what you do, and then who makes a decision one way or the other for good or for bad based on what they see, what they hear, the attitude they see expressed. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Then number six, we saw specific destinations and goals, just like with Paul. That deals with God's plan for our life, and we're going to talk about that in detail tonight. The will of God in your life. But the last point of our overview last week that we talked about was number seven, specific supernatural elements that cannot happen by chance when connected to everything else, like that storm, Euroclidon, that Paul is about to hit. There are things that happen in our lives that we can't explain any other way than by supernatural intervention. And I gave you the illustration of when my father was in the military and stationed at a secret base in South America and went swimming in the ocean and couldn't get back. And how at a precise moment in time when my father was about to give up, a young blonde man appeared by his side and said, buddy, need a hand? and helped him up on the next wave and he rode it all the way to shore. Whether that was an angel or simply another strong swimmer who came and gave him help, we won't know till we get to heaven. But it was the precise moment of need and God sent that individual to help him. So that brings us to tonight. Sailing slow after fast, part two. Let's go back now and talk about that sixth element that I just mentioned that God is working in the life of every person, in particular, in the lives of his children whom he loves with an intense, everlasting love. Remember that when you are facing things that are crisis situations in your life. You are loved with an intense, everlasting love by an omnipotent God who will not be thwarted in his plan and who does not allow anything to happen in your life that is not for your good. He is your guardian. He is your protector. He is the one who loves you and cares for you enough to send his own son to die for you. We're talking about tonight the God who loves us with an intense, everlasting love. So let's talk about the specific destinations and goals that God has for your life. I want to expand that tonight and talk about the specific will of God for your life. The message is entitled, Sailing Slow After Fast, Part 2. Now, obviously, I've made a little play on words here because the word fast shows up in the text, but the fast in the text is talking about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 17. It was required by God to be celebrated by every Jew on the 9th of Av, the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. It was a time of afflicting their souls a time of repenting and confessing their sins. They still celebrate it. The ninth of Av has been burned into the mind of every Jew in history by all the horrible things that took place. The destruction of the city of Jerusalem by the Babylonians and other events. Perhaps next week I'll give you a list of those. Uh, I've been working out this list and there are like seven or eight major things in Jewish history that happened, horrible things that happened on the ninth of Av. Although the Jewish calendar doesn't precisely line up with our Western calendar, this time where Paul is sailing is probably about October 1st of that year. That's a very dangerous time. It's very dangerous to be sailing on the Mediterranean at that time of year. So let's make some applications with questions that we all face as we sail slow after fast. Everything's been going smoothly and suddenly things just seem to be grinding to a halt. Let me ask some questions. Sort of answer these in your mind as I'm asking these questions. Have you ever felt like your life is sailing through 
what you feel like are dangerous waters. Ever felt like in your life you've been sailing through dangerous waters? You look over the side of the boat and hear these sharks. While I was in China, my host had a book on the great Olympian, Louis Zamperini, and how his plane went down over the Pacific Ocean and he was there in this raft with some other guys and how they were circled by sharks. Now one of the rafts that they had was leaking badly and how they tried to patch it and how certain large sharks came up and rubbed along the bottom of the raft and they could feel it as the shark would rub its fin along the bottom of the raft. It was dangerous waters. It was dangerous waters because they were floating toward Japan. They ultimately got captured and they ultimately got placed in concentration camps. They were sailing through dangerous waters. Have you ever felt like your life was sailing through dangerous waters? Another question, have you ever felt like there are scary things that you can't control in your life? Here's Paul, he can't control what's going on. He's a prisoner. He's being dragged along with a bunch of other prisoners. They're Roman soldiers in charge. They're stronger than he is, they got him tied up. They're being courteous to him because they know he's not really guilty. They've been tipped off, but they have to do their job. He's sailing with sailors who don't care whether he lives or dies. In fact, sailors who are gonna to try to abandon the ship and let everybody else drown. He can't control that. Have you ever felt like there are scary things that you can't control in your life? Another question. Have you felt that other people around you are making decisions that affect you and you can't do anything about it? That's what we got in our text. There are people around Paul that are making decisions that affect him, but he can't do anything about it. Have you ever felt like you were in that situation where other people are making decisions that affect you and you can't do anything about it? Can you think of a time? I know all of us, when we were kids, other people around us were making decisions and we couldn't do anything about it. Our parents would drag us into the car and we didn't want to go and we, they would drive for a long time and we'd want to stop and get out and go to the bathroom. They'd say, no, hold it. You know, other people around us making decisions and we can't do anything about it. You've probably had some of that in your adult life too. Another question. Have you ever felt like you're sailing really slow and you want to pick up the pace? You want to see some action, you want to see some change of scenery, or you want to get out of that dangerous situation. You'd like to sail a lot faster and get away from this. Have you ever felt like that? Here's one that I think we can all answer yes to. Have you ever gotten bored with the dullness of your life? Same old thing every day. Oh, hum. oh man, I gotta get up and I gotta go to work. And I gotta be there by eight o'clock in the morning or a lot of jobs that I've had, I had to be there by seven o'clock in the morning or earlier. And it was dull. It was the kind of thing that you thought, this is so boring, it's driving me nuts. Have you ever gotten bored with the dullness of your life? Another question, have you ever felt like your life was just dragging along? You didn't seem to be going anywhere. You know, you look ahead and it's a blank horizon. Doesn't look like there's anything glorious out there. Why are you going this way? Why has God put you here? What in the world is this desert all about? We've talked about the wilderness wanderings in the morning worship. Have you ever felt like you're trudging uphill in the mud? That you're not making any progress to the goals that you have set for yourself? You're a person with drive, you're a person who has goals, you're a person who wants to see things get accomplished. Man, I've, I've been here all the time. Feeling like I'm trying to trudge uphill in the mud. Coming over to church tonight, some of you uh, went through some pretty heavy rainstorms. One person even called me and told me that they had almost gotten stuck and they, they didn't think they were going to make it and then the, God helped them get through that. 
Have you ever trudged uphill in the mud, not made progress to the goal that you have set for yourself? Another question. Do you like to organize and try to control what's going on in your life? Everybody who likes to organize and control what's going on in your own life, raise your hand. Yeah, we all. Well, there's one out there who doesn't care about controlling what's going on in their life. Everybody else controls what wants to control. We all want to do what we want to do, don't we? Don't you want to do what you want to do? Of course you do. Let me ask you another question. Do you like to control the lives of other people and make them do what you want them to do to make your own life easier? As you think about it, is there somebody in your life right now that you wish you could control? Because if you could control them and make them do what you want, it would make your life so much easier. Have you been there? Man, I tell you, there. <laughs> that's when I think, if I could just get some other people to do certain things around here, I wouldn't have to do them. It would make my life so much easier. I've been there. Another question. Do you feel like nothing is working, no matter what you do? <laughs> nothing ever seems to work. It doesn't matter what I do. Like, there's a bucket down here in the middle of the floor because it was raining today, and that bucket has got water in it. It's got a towel in the bottom so we don't hear the click, 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 click. Thank you for whoever put that there. It seems like nothing you do seems to work. It always has the same drip. Here's another question. Do you have a hollow feeling in your gut that every plan that you make fails miserably? You try to put a good face on, but every plan you make seems to have some termites in it, and it doesn't quite cut it. Do you sense that every time you invest your energy, your time, and your resources in something, it falls flat? Say, well, I did have a, a little bit of success on this, but yeah, most of the things that I try to... I, I invest time, I invest energy, I invest resources, but they always seem to fall flat. I hope you get the idea of where I'm going here. Have you ever felt frustrated, like you're spinning your wheels, you're getting no traction, you're wasting time, even though you hate wasting time? Now, I happen to be one of those people who hates wasting time. I despise wasting time. Because as you've heard me say, you're not wasting time, you're wasting your life. Our life is only so long, and it's made up of little blocks of what we call time. And so I like to make sure that I'm investing my time in things that are going to be profitable for eternity. I hate wasting time. But you know, I've many times felt frustrated, like I'm spinning my wheels, I'm getting no traction, I'm wasting time, even though I hate it. Another question. Have you ever felt like you're giving it everything you've got and nothing happens? I know some of you are like that. You're pouring your life into it. You're giving it everything you've got and nothing happens. And you get frustrated, you get bitter, you get angry. Have you ever done your best and you've gotten no praise for a job well done? Like people just look at you and they shrug their shoulders or they laugh at you when they, you fall flat on your face. Ever happened to you? You've done your best and nobody seemed to notice. Okay, that's my questions. Let's apply them. If you answered yes to any of those questions, this message is for you. Learning to relax and keep your eyes open to what God is doing in your life is the key to when you're going through times like the questions I just asked. When that happens, there are three, I hope you're taking notes, there are three essential principles to remember when you feel like this. If you felt like any of those 20 questions that I just gave you, are happening or have happened in your life, there are three essential principles to remember when you feel like that. Number one, God can do it without you. Principle number one is God can do it without you. His purpose in your life is not to see how much stuff 
you can accomplish. We all focus on that because that's the way the world thinks. How much stuff can I accomplish? Or as the bumper sticker says, you know, he who dies with the most toys wins. No, that's not right. God's purpose for your life is not to see how much stuff you can accomplish. Principle number two. God's primary purpose in your life is to conform you to the image of Christ. Principle number two. God's primary purpose in your life is to conform you to the image of Christ. Principle number three. Did you know that God strong arms the universe with total precision to make sure that all of the elements, all of the events, all of his heavenly creatures, angels and demons, all of the people that he has created on planet Earth provide the exact and precise setting to accomplish his purpose for your life to his own glory and the glory of his son, Jesus Christ. Or if we shorten that so it's easier to take that as a note, God strong arms the entire universe to accomplish his purpose for your life, for his own glory and the glory of his son, Jesus Christ. God strong arms the entire universe, irresistible power to accomplish his purpose for your life to his own glory and to the glory of his son, Jesus Christ. That glorious truth is laid out for us in black and white in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. This is why Paul could relax on his voyage to Rome. Here's what he wrote to the letter to the Romans. Romans 8, beginning in verse 28. And we know that all things work together, not some things, not most things. All things work together for good to a specific category of people. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now God's in control of all things, even the events that occur in the lives of the wicked. God is in control, but it's not for their good. Notice they work together for good to a category of people, to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For those who don't love God, for those who hate him and shake their fist at him, for those who are not called according to his purpose, things work out for bad because they end in hell. But for the believer, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And he gives it to us in verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, which doesn't just mean God looked down the corridors of time and saw what would happen, and so he chose on the basis of what would just sort of automatically happen because he's not really in control. Foreknowledge is knowing all the possible events that could take place because there's an infinite number of possibilities. There could have been, for example, one more grain of sand on the seashore. There could have been one more sparrow flying through the sky. There could have been one less brontosaurus. There could have been one difference in the seconds that have passed between creation and now. Do you understand how many infinite possibilities there are? God have chosen the sun to be just a little bit less hot and then put the earth a little bit closer to the sun and still get the same effect. Foreknowledge is not knowing what's going to happen because nothing would have happened if God had not started the process with a specific act of creation at a specific point in eternity, not a different point in eternity, eternity past, eternity future, time here. God is the one who chose what to do, when to do it,
and what to include in his creation. For his own glory and for the good of his elect. Your people, your God is too small, my God is too small. The infinite God of the universe, it boggles our minds when we begin to think in these terms. It expands out and out and out and out until we can no longer think that far. All things work together for good, for whom he did foreknow. He not only saw what would happen, he's the one who caused it to happen. He chose a precise series of events, a precise series of people, created a precise set of genes in Adam and Eve, created a precise moment of conception with a specific sperm and a specific egg for every human being that has ever lived on planet Earth at precisely his time so that in the end Jesus Christ would be glorified to the greatest possible extent. For whom he did foreknow. There's also a personal element to that. When you study the word to know in scripture it says, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived. He knew you, personal relationship, before you were created. Before you were formed in the belly. Isaiah talks about it. Jeremiah talks about it. He had a personal relationship already going with you because you were part of his divine plan. He did predestinate and here is what he predestinated for you to be conformed to the image of his son do you think there's anything in history that happens that is not designed to reach the goal that God has set for himself is he ever stymied in what he has planned to do it tells us here that all things that ever happen that ever happened now, that ever will happen, have a goal in mind to conform you and me to the image of his son. God's purpose for your life is not to see how much stuff you can accomplish. His purpose for your life is to conform you to the image of Christ. I talked about the image this morning. How we are not the light, we are merely the mirror that reflects the light, that shows what the sun looks like. When you look in the mirror, that's your image. And if the mirror is dirty, you don't see your image very clearly. If the mirror is cracked, you don't see your image very clearly. But if the mirror is whole, and if the silver on the back of the mirror is flawless, and if the mirror is clean, then it reflects your face. And as the light comes and reflects on your face, you see more precisely in the mirror what you look like. You are the mirror that is going to be conformed to the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. That's an earth-shattering concept, people. That God could take us dirty, filthy, little, squirmy people on earth and perfectly reflect in us Jesus Christ. That's God's purpose for you. That's what it says here. To be conformed to the image of his Son. That he, that is the Son, might be the firstborn among many brethren to make us into the brethren of Christ. That's why he took on humanity permanently. It's not Jesus came to earth, became human, died, was buried, rose again, and then threw away humanity and decided, man, I'm going to go back to the spirit realm again and I'm not going to have any more of this body stuff. Man, that's really a pain in the neck. The book of Hebrews talks about him calling us brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. That's the irresistible call of God. 
whom he called, them he also justified. We talked about the difference between justification and imputation this morning. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Notice it's in the past tense. It's still future for us in terms of time and space. But in the mind of God, it's already as good as done. Now, let me ask you another question, which brings us back to that series of questions I just asked. Have you ever paid attention to the fact that the setting of these verses in Romans 8 is precisely the personal frustration that you have that I just talked about? Did you notice that? The preceding verses are what talk about that. If we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. Patience is putting up with the difficult circumstances of life. Long-suffering is putting up with different pe difficult people. Patience, and they're two different Greek words. Uh, patience is putting up with difficult circumstances. Long-suffering is putting up with difficult people. You're facing difficult circumstances. Here's Paul on the ship. Facing some difficult circumstances? You bet he is. But he had a living hope. And that's what it says here. If we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Have you felt like you were helpless, not able to do anything? Your life is being controlled by other people and by circumstances and events. Look at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. You go through it, don't you? So do I. Our weaknesses, the stuff that I used to be able to do, I can't do anymore. I used to be able to run a mile, very close to four minutes, never quite reached four minutes. Washer can't do that anymore. The Spirit helps our infirmities. Also, you get frustrated, you don't know what to pray about, you don't know what to do. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We're praying the wrong prayers too, not just we don't know what to pray for and how to pray for it. We don't even know, you know, we pray the wrong things. But the Spirit itself make the intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Groaning is a huge expression of emotion. Oh! Have you ever been there and let out that kind of a groan? The Holy Spirit is interceding for you with that kind of a groaning because we are so weak, we are so helpless we complain so much we always seem to be focused on the wrong things we try to do it in our own strength we want our will, not God's will we pray for the wrong things and the Holy Spirit says enough with that those are hitting the ceiling, bouncing down hitting the ceiling, bouncing down the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered when you're going through those difficult times remember that's happening and the Spirit of God. Do you think the Spirit of our God ever gets a no answer when He makes these intercessions on your behalf? Do you realize that because He never gets a no answer, that's why some of the difficult circumstances still continue? Because what is God's purpose in the passage? He is conforming you to the image of Christ. He is getting rid of the sludge. He's getting rid of the dross. He's getting rid of the trash and the rubbish and the waste stuff that's in your life and burning it off. Verse 27, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. God searches your heart. You try to keep things hidden behind closed doors in your heart. You try to keep the dirty little secrets hidden off in a corner or in a shoebox under the bed in your heart. There's somebody searching your heart. And he knows every nook, every cranny, every shoebox, every locked door, everything you've swept under the rug. He searches your heart. All the stuff you're trying to hide from him when you pray. And he knows the mind of the Spirit. He knows what's in your heart. He knows the mind of the Spirit. He puts them both together. Because he that is the Spirit of God makes intercession for the saints. We talked about saints this morning, didn't we? The holy ones. The ones who have been set apart. The Spirit of God is not praying for the unregenerate world. The Spirit of God is interceding for you and me. 
He makes intercession for the saints. Now listen to the last phrase. According to the will of God. The Holy Spirit never makes intercession contrary to the will of God. The Holy Spirit, as he intercedes for us, as we go through those difficult circumstances that we need to deal with with patience, as we saw in the first part of those verses, the Holy Spirit prays to the Father, as Jesus did also, according to the will of God. The will of God is what for your life? To conform you to the image of Christ. Let me ask a couple more questions. Have you ever stopped to consider that God is on your side when you feel this way with all those frustrating questions that I just asked at the beginning? Have you ever stopped to consider that God is on your side when you feel that way? And nothing in all of the universe can resist him. Pretty nice to have a football player on the team like that. The entire team on the other side can't stop him when he begins to run forward toward the goal line. They all try to pile on him, and he has all 11 guys piled on top of him, and he's still standing, and he's still running down the field, and everybody's trying very hard to pull him down, and they can't do it. Nothing can resist his will. Nebuchadnezzar found that out. He gave praise to the God of heaven. Nothing in the armies of heaven can stop him or send him, What doest thou? Another question. When you feel frustrated that your plans, emphasize the word your, when you feel frustrated that your plans are not being accomplished like you want, they're not being accomplished as fast as you want, some of us see plans are moving forward, but we don't like the speed. We want it to go faster. We're sailing slow after fast. When you feel like your plans are not going as fast as you want, have you ever considered that the most important thing is not your plans, but God's plan for your life? And remember one very important principle. God is never late. God is never late. Even when you feel like you're sailing slow after you thought that you were sailing along at a good clip. When you're frustrated at sailing slow, remember what Paul says in the same passage beginning in verse 31. Remember these words. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Does the Father ever withhold something from the Son? Did you notice that we're in the Son's boat? As we sail along, we're in his boat. How shall he not also with him freely give us all things? You want things outside of the boat, you're not going to get them. But you know, God's boat is full of infinite goodness. God's boat is full of infinite blessing. God's boat is full of infinite things that you cannot imagine. I have not seen or mind ever possibly imagined the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. We've just been talking about God loving us and us loving him and being called according to his purpose. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. In other words, there's an answer to every one of these things that seem to be such big walls that we can't get around. Oh, people are condemning me for things. Okay, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God's the one who declares you righteous. Who is he that condemneth? You evil person. Huh. It's Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. We've just talked about the intercession of the Holy Spirit. 
He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Twice in this passage it talks about how Christ makes intercession for us. Christ, who died, rose again, who's even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. When you feel like the boat is sinking, when you're not sailing as fast as you want, when the storms of life begin to hit, Paul answers, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? His boat doesn't sink. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution? None of us have ever had to face that. Not to the extent Paul is facing here. Or famine. You and I have never been through a famine. When I was in China, I talked to people who had been through the last great famine. And the horrendous things they had to eat, if they could find them at all. You've never been through that, neither have I. Or nakedness. I think all of us have had clothes all of our lives. Or peril or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Listen. Remember that set of questions that I asked at the beginning? All those things deal with our conveniences, don't they? All those things deal with our schedule. All those things deal with our timing. All those things deal with our carnal desires and our wants. None of them deal with the kind of pressures that Paul's talking about. And Paul says, the grace of God is sufficient even for those things. We complain about little stuff. The will of God is to burn all the little stuff out of our lives. So we'll be walking where he wants us to walk, doing what he wants us to do, saying what he wants us to say, thinking what he wants us to think, having the attitudes he wants us to have, having the motivations that he wants us to have. Focused on eternity, not on time. Nay, in all these things, not in some of them, not in most of them, just like in verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to the purpose. Now he brings that term in, into the text again. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than conquerors, not merely conquerors. We not only conquer, but we go beyond conquest. Because God always is above and beyond all that we could ask or think. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, that covers everything, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Where did we start? We started with the love of God and with the purpose of God. And the God loves you with an infinite, everlasting love. Why do you not have to get frustrated about all those things that we just listed in the 20 questions? Because you are loved. You are loved by one whose will cannot ever be resisted and nothing can happen to you outside of his will and his will for you is always good. The perfect will of God. So even when it hurts, he's using it to conform you, his goal, to conform you to the image of Christ. You feel like you're sailing slow? You feel like you're sailing through dangerous waters? You feel like you're spinning your wheels and not getting the things done that you want to get done? That you'd like to see things happen a lot faster than they're happening? And we know, not we guess, not we hope, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called 
according to his purpose. Paul wrote that to the Romans. He's on his way to Rome on a boat where he has no control. And yet he has perfect confidence in the will of God for his life. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your power, for your purpose. Your purpose is not to see how much stuff we can do. Your purpose is to conform us to the image of Christ. And you will accomplish your purpose so that we might receive your greatest good and you would receive the greatest glory to your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us with patience to run the race, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Help us to consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest we become weary and faint in our minds. We have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Thank you, Father, that you are not only our God, but that you are our Father, and that you love us with an infinite, perfect, precisely designed love to accomplish your goal of conforming us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight.